mother was and her fourth grandson. It, it's, it's a lot, and it's it a is. lot on the parents, too. If, if you don't have supportive parents, it's not going to be done. My grandson is old as hell at a young age. So I always think it's still it's interesting. Interesting.
Good morning. I welcome you to Big Canoe Chapel, those of you who are here and also those of you online. We're delighted to have you with us. Beverly Zimmerman joins me today and Beverly will be sharing in an announcement with me in just a few moments. But I want to turn, call your attention to the end of the worship service. If you'd turn in your bulletin to the end of the worship service, and let me say a word about those two services. Ash Wednesday, that's the beginning of Lent, the 40-day period before Easter. It's on a Wednesday, February the 22nd, and from 12 to 1 here in the chapel, we will have the imposition of ashes. It's come and go, which means that you can stay the entire hour for reflection, we'll have music, etc., or you can be here for just a moment. Whenever you come to the chancel, that's when David and I will have the imposition of ashes upon your forehead as we begin the Lenten season. And as you know, Lent is a season of reflection and a time for getting ready for Easter. Then the following Sunday, which is February the 26th, it's the first Sunday of Lent, and also it's our regular Holy Communion time. And during that time, we'll have the communion stations on each side as we always do. But here in the center, we'll have a bowl. And Mary, would you come forward, please? Mary is the chair of the Altar Guild. And Mary, you have other Altar Guild persons who help you. Are any of the other Altar Guild persons here? Would you stand, please? Would you stand? We, we need to express our appreciation to them for all that they do. And Mary, I know you said you didn't want to say anything, but now that I have you up here, show them the stone and what's going to happen with that stone. He wanted stones for the uh, Remember Your Baptism. And I said, I really like the idea, and I got the job. <laughs> so, so anyway, we've gotten black stones and Anita White and Barbara Mock, and I painted 300 of them yesterday. The crosses are not perfect, but, you know, we're not, I'm not an artist, neither is Anita, but, you know, Barbara. But anyway, that's what they're going to look like when you get them on the 29th, 26th. And the way this will work will be, if you choose to do this, you know, we'll have the bowl here, and of course, you'll be in front of me, but let's do it like this. And of course, uh, some people have hair in the front. Some of us, some of, some of us, that's not a problem, you know? And so, some of you know what I'm talking about. But we will have the moistened stone, and I will make the sign of the cross on your forehead, and then I will give you the stone. And as I shared with you, over the years, uh, people have been buried with, their, with this stone in their hand. Did a funeral, as I shared with you, a week and a half or two weeks ago, where the gentleman had the stone in his hand. I did a wedding in the fall where the bride asked me, I knew her uh, when she was nine years old, and she said, I want to use my stone along with her husband. We did remember your baptism. So I hope that you'll uh, uh, take part in that, and we'll give you the stone, and you do with the stone whatever is best for you. As long as it brings us closer to Jesus, that's what we want. But Mary, for you and the Altar Guild, we thank you for all that you do for us all the time. Now, Beverly, you're here with the Endowment Committee. Beverly is the chair of the Big Canoe Endowment Committee. Tell us what the endowment does and what, what it's about. Sure. Well, first of all, um, let me tell you about what we're going to do this morning. The Endowment Committee this morning wants you to know that God loves you. And uh, at the end of the service, we're going to be passing out roses to each one of you, and that includes you gentlemen. And this is not for your wives, okay, <laughs> for Valentine's Day. This is a symbol that God loves you. And what we would like for you to do is share the legacy of God's love. So pass that rose along to someone else today or tomorrow that might need to know God's love. So that's what we're doing today. Now, the endowment fund itself, as many of you know, um, it, it, the, the, the monies are invested and set aside for special needs and projects of the chapel that fall outside of the operating budget of the chapel. Um, if you would like to know how to make a donation to the endowment fund, um, first of all, all of the endowment fund committee members that are present today will have a green ribbon. You can speak to any one of us. 
But if you really want to know a little bit more about it, go to our website, uh, the dickcanoechapel.com website, click on giving, and then on endowment. And we have a video out there that you can look at and learn more about endowment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your leadership and what you and your committee do for the kingdom of God here at Big Canoe. May we stand as we read responsibly our call to worship. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. For with you is the fountain of life. Be seated, please. Right here. Right here. Right here. Right here. Okay. Now, today, we're going to, the Education Committee asked me if we could have a children's moment, and I said, sure. And they said, well, who will do it? And I said, well, I'll be glad to. And so, I've asked the children to bring me an object. They can bring anything they want, and we'll try to discover something about God. Okay? So, what do we have today? What do you have? Come on, speak in the microphone. I'm going to come up closer. Magnifying glass. 
a magnifying glass. Can I see it? Okay. All right. Did you bring something? A fish. A fish. Can I see that? Hmm. Maybe I shouldn't have volunteered to do this. <laughs> and what, what do we have here? Pretzel. What a pretzel. A pretzel. Yes, let me see. Let's pray. Great. <laughs> we can learn today that we don't always need to volunteer to do things. Well, you know, we can look, you know, this magnifying glass, we can see this pretzel even better. And God helps, helps us to see things better, right? Okay? And with a fish, oh my goodness. Do you know that a fish, can a fish swim? Yeah, yeah. Are you sure? Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. I can't hear you. What? Yes. Okay. And a. And I watched Ariel today. You watched Daryl today? Ariel. The little mermaid. Oh, okay. <laughs> Ariel. I'll have to watch that this afternoon. <laughs> And so the fish swims like Ariel does. Yeah. And what in what? And Ariel has a pet fish that's named Flounder, and he's a fish and he can swim. Okay. So God creates all of us to do different things, is that right? Yeah. E e even all even all fish can swim. Really? All fish can swim. And Kathy, I see you brought something too. I did. I, I brought a heart. Why would you bring a heart? Because that's one of the things Miss Sandra put out for us to bring. Okay. <laughs> and do you know what I have to say about that? No. Bless your heart. <laughs> and so what's happening in two days? Anybody know? What, what do we think about with hearts? Love. Love, exactly. And who loves us more than anybody? Jesus. Exactly. That's right. And God. And God. And God. And Father and Mom. Hey, that's right. They're a father and a son. Exactly. Boy, y'all are doing great. You know, I want us to pray together. And when we pray, would you do something for me? I'm going to say a phrase, and I want you to say the phrase back to me, okay? Can we do that? You understand what we're going to do? All right, let's close our eyes. Okay. Dear God, Dear God thank, you thank you that you love us, that you love us and you give us, and you give us the, opportunity the opportunity to love you. To love you. In, Jesus name. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's express our appreciation to these children. They did a great job, didn't they? ready to pray? That's either a yes or a no. Well, for one thing, we get to pray for the boys and girls and their leaders. And we get to pray for a chapel that really wants to see more boys and girls and families. So really, as we pray in just a couple minutes, I want you to pray for that. What an opportunity. Those of you joining online, we want to pray with you and pray for you as well. But those of us in the room, there's a lot of prayer concerns. I'm going to choose not to read everything that you see on here. However, there's a couple names I just want to call attention to. Some of you got the word that Sue uh, Hausman's mom passed away. And Sue and now her brother was living here in Big Canoe. So be praying for them. Right now, we don't know all the details or any details about follow-up funeral arrangements, but as, as we find them out, we're going to try to let you know. There's, there's another name on your list. Greg Duncan has had surgery. You saw that recovering. But since we put this uh, uh, bulletin together, we discovered that Greg's son-in-law passed away. Now, I tell you what, this is hard on anyone at any time, but uh, we're going to try to find out ways that we can be supportive of and praying for them. Uh, you, you also know there's a lot of names we can be praying for. Uh, be praying for Sue and Dick, Hamill. You know, the list goes on and on. I'm afraid 
to start listing some, we'll miss on so many others. You know all that. But as we get ready to pray in just a minute, I'm going to ask um, Harry, Nancy, I know you're here. I'm going to ask you just to walk down here with me. I just want you to stand with me. Uh, Harry's going to sing this solo in just a minute. <laughs> Surprise. No. While they're coming, I just want to call attention. Some of you know this. They're going to be leaving this week for a special ministry in India. And so some of you know that. Others of you, I want you to call attention to it. I'm just going to ask you to stand here. Uh, that solo will be at the 3 o'clock service. <laughs> It'll be so low you so can't low, I can't. I know, I know. Um, so while they're here, it's not to call attention to them as opposed to others, but let's be praying for them. There's two other things I'm just going to call attention to. Some of you maybe have, have heard already that there's a revival that has broken out at Asbury College up in Kentucky. Um, some of you know that's the, the revival, that's the location where Lynn Walker had experienced a revival years ago. And here God's doing something again. It's really ga gaining the attention of a lot of folks all over the country. And I'm understanding there's a, at, least, at least one other location, I think it's in Ohio, where spontaneously the Holy Spirit is doing the same kind of stuff. I'm going to ask you in just a minute when we're praying, will you pray that God will do something like that here? I don't know what that would look like. But we, we want to be desperate for the Lord and desperate for how he's at work. So instead of putting you folks on the spot to ask you to lead in prayer, I'm going to ask you folks to join us in praying. God, just do a great work. While you're praying, I want you to pray for our pastor. And I want you to pray for what God's doing, not just now, but even in the future. Oh, yeah, there is one other thing. Would you look around the room right now? Yeah. And just spot someone, if you know him well or not, Someone for whom you'll pray. Just go ahead. Some of you, you're, you're just sitting there. <laughs> and some of you feel comfortable pointing. I want you to notice that there's some folks in the room. And I want you to know that at least one person in this room praying for you. Would you be willing to pray and to expect God to do some remarkable things? We've got a lot of prayer concerns. But let's go before the Father. And after we prayed, after I've led in prayer, I'm going to... Lead us in praying the Lord's Prayer. So let's, let's pray together. Jesus, thank you so much even this morning for allowing us to get a glimpse of what you're doing with boys and girls and leaders. God, bring about a revival here. We love to see not just more boys and girls, but we want to see your Holy Spirit move in families and parents and grandparents and all. Father, can't wait to see what you do. We get a glimpse in the, some of the news media about what you're doing and other places, like on some college campuses, but Lord, please let us see you at work here. We pray for each other. There are some folks who are right now going through the valley of the shadow of death. Some are dealing with um, issues. Maybe they're going to have surgery or follow-up. There's so much going on. We pray for ourselves. We pray for each other. And Father, allow us as a chapel to be very diligent in being part of your kingdom work, not just here, not just in India, but Lord, wherever you may send us. Father, teach us how to pray. Father, teach us how to be dependent on you and to repent and to call on your name and to seek your face. Father, teach us how to pray like you taught your followers how to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory
Lord Jesus, thank you so much for allowing us to see you at work and for joining you. You're the giving God. You've given us everything that we have and more than we can imagine. You gave your own son. Father, teach us how to be not only grateful, but to have how to partner with you as you give. So, Father, now thank you for the privilege you give us in worship to return a portion back to you. Bless those who have given. Bless the gift. And God, bless those who are going to be receiving this as expression of ministry. We give ourselves to you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Remain standing, please, for our prayer. <clears throat> Gracious and almighty God, we give you thanks for your holy word. As we look at a very familiar passage, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be with preacher and listener alike, interpret and speak to our hearts in the unique need of every soul so that we might be more like you, Lord Jesus. We offer our prayer in your name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> now in two days we're going to have a special day and what that day is Valentine's, Valentine's Day and what do we do on Valentine's Day yes. what kiss? kiss okay All right. what what was that Spend money. Well, I was thinking more about a card or something like that. <laughs> uh, the Valentine's Day is only two days away. How many of you who have a significant other in your life have bought a card for that person? Can I see your hand? There are many more ladies' hands I mean, up than there are gentlemen. You still have two days. Reminds me, a year or two ago, Patty called me on the 13th of February. I was at the office of the church I was serving at the time. And she said, Tommy, would you stop at the grocery store on your way home and pick up something? And I said, sure, I'll be glad to. By the way, I had already bought my Valentine's card a couple of days before. And so on the 13th, on the way home, I stopped at the grocery store. I have never seen so many men in the grocery store. <laughs> It was packed with men. You know how they have those floral areas in the grocery store where they sell flowers? Stripped. There was nothing there. <laughs> candy areas. Even the little, you know, candy bars. Gone. Everything was gone. Chewing gum. Gone. Everything was gone. <laughs> Valentine's Day is a special time. And it reminds me of the Valentine's Day that I had, I experienced, my most memorable one probably, as a child when I was in the fourth grade. In the fourth grade, me and all the other boys in our school, the Mountain View Elementary School in Cobb County, we were all smitten with Nellie Mae. <laughs> now that was her 
her name is not her last name, but May is Nellie May, good southern name. Nellie May, strawberry blonde, blue eyes, little freckles. Now, you're not Nellie May, are you? Nellie May's not in this con <laughs> congregation. Well, Nellie May, just, she paid no attention to any of us guys. And we were trying to get her attention. Out on the playground, we try to run faster than anybody else or, or do, you know, the little gym set to excel. She paid no attention to us. So Valentine's Day was coming, and my good friend Tony Bunch, we went to his house a few days before Valentine's Day, and we heard his mother, Barbara, say to his father, George, Barbara said, George, Whatever you do this Valentine's Day, do not buy me any of that Kmart candy again. <laughs> We've still got all of it left over in the drawer in the front. And George said, well, what do you want? She said, what I want is a Whitman's sampler. <laughs> well, Tony turned to me and said, what's a Whitman sampler? I said, I don't know. He said, well, then why don't we stop at the store tomorrow after school and we'll find out what a Whitman sample is. It must be something special, you know, if mom's asking for that. And well, let's find out. So after school, we went in and we went up to the gentleman. We said, sir, do you know what a Whitman sampler is? He said, yes. We said, well, do you have any of that? He said, yes, it's right over there. And he took us over to Whitman sampler. And we picked out one that's about the size of my Bible. He said, how much is it? He said, five dollars. I didn't have $5. <laughs> Tony didn't have $5. But together, we pooled our money and we had $5. So we bought it. We went back to Tony's house. We thought, this obviously has that magical allure to it that will win Nellie Mae's affection. <laughs> so we read on it that it was candy. So you just got cellophane around it. It started smelling. <laughs> Couldn't smell anything through the cell phone. So we decided we'll just cut a little piece of the cell phone. We didn't mean to cut very much. We just cut a little piece. And when we were pulling it back and had that wonderful aroma, we tore the cell phone. We thought, well, let's go ahead and take the cell phone off. And we did. And once we took the cell phone off, he said, we might as well see what's inside the box. <laughs> We've gone this far. So we raised the lid. And oh, oh, that aroma. Much better than trying to smell it through the cell phone. Wonderful. And now that we've gone this far, why don't we sample it? So we both took just a little bite out of a piece, and we thought we can put it back and <laughs> turn it upside down. She won't see, but it tastes so good. And my brilliant friend Tony said, Tommy, we can eat and we can replace it with Kmart candy. <laughs> I said, that's brilliant. We started eating. We devoured about half of that. Went to the bottom layer, devoured about half. Went and got the Kmart candy, filled it back up. And we were so pleased with what we had done. And as we started to close the lid, we noticed something. What's in here? What? That's right, the names. It's a glossary. It tells which candies are in which slot, the top layer or the bottom layer. We thought, oh no. She will know what we have done. So Tony came up with a brilliant idea. He said, we've got some poster board downstairs at my house. And he said, I'll go down to the basement and get some and we'll glue it on there. And while I'm down there, Tommy, you compose a poem and we'll write it on there. I said, okay. So he went downstairs and got the poster board. He came back, cut it out. He said, you got the poem ready? I said, yes, I do, and I'm quite proud of it. He said, well, what is it? Roses are red. <laughs> Violets are blue. Tommy and Tony sure love you. <laughs> Pretty good, don't you think? Well, we glued that in. The next day, trembling little fourth grade boys went up to Nellie Mae, afraid. And we presented it to her and said, Happy Valentine's Day, Mel, tell him and Nellie Mae. And she said, Thank you, Tommy. And thank you, Tony. She knew our names. 
She had never spoken to us before. She actually knew our names. And of course, we ran away. We had won her affection until lunchtime. At lunchtime, the girls are over here in their part of the cafeteria. The boys are over here in our part of the cafeteria. And we're looking at them. They're looking at us. And we sort of wave a little bit. And they had that box of candy open. And she was sharing it with her friends. And they were eating it. And then they started looking right up here. And I thought, they're just admiring my poetry. And then they ripped my poetry out. And they started looking at the glossary. And then they looked at us. And then they looked back. And then they looked at us. And then they knew what we had done. And Nellie Mae never spoke to Tommy or Tony again. <laughs> never. Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day, there will be more weddings on Valentine's Day than any other day of the year, especially when it's on a Saturday. The last time Valentine's Day was on a Saturday was 2015. On that Saturday, I did six weddings in one day. <laughs> Most I've ever done. I could have done more, but... Just, I couldn't travel from the various places that much, but six weddings in one day. One of the weddings, not, not that wedding, but one wedding that comes to my mind, I did, and the gentleman who was getting married played or had played for the Atlanta Falcons. In 1998, you know, the Falcons went to their first Super Bowl, and he had played on that team, a reserve linebacker. His name was Robert, and I had been Robert's pastor, and so he had asked me to officiate at his wedding. Now, David, as you know, Harry, as you know, they put us, the minister, in with the groom and the best man a few minutes before we come out. It is interesting what they say during that two minutes. I mean, you hear some really interesting things. So it was with Robert. Now, catch what he said. He said, Tommy, are we going out in a few minutes? I said, yes, Robert, we are. He said, Tommy. Oh, Tommy, I've, I played before millions of people on the Super Bowl. But Tommy, I'm so nervous. Tommy, I can't even remember your name. <laughs> then he said, are we going out? I said, yeah, we're going out in less than a minute. He said, oh, Tommy. He said, I'm so glad I don't have to make any important decisions. <laughs> in an attempt to be pastoral, I put my hand on his shoulder. I said, Robert, in about 25 minutes, you'll never have to make another decision in your life. <laughs> Weddings. Today's scripture is about a wedding. So if you have your Bibles or uh, scripture with you, we're going to look at John 2, verses 1 through 11. I'm going to read it, and we'll, I'll be stopping at various places to give a word of clarity. Remember, we're going to be looking at this through their eyes, not 2023 eyes. We're going to be looking at it through their customs, not our customs, not our ways. And I'll give a word of explanation as we move along. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had been invited also to the wedding. Now, friends... Notice two things there. First of all, on the third day. In today's culture, you have a wedding. The bride and groom go to the reception. And when the reception is over, they leave. Often we'll throw bird seed or something at them. And they leave and we all go home. That's not the way it was in the ancient world. This was the third day of their wedding festival, as they called it. Wedding festivals usually lasted at least four or five days, often 10, sometimes 12 or 14, according to the financial ability of the bride's parents. So this is the third day. Brides and uh, grooms would stay. They would not depart and go off. They would stay for that five-day, 10-day, 12-day festival, whatever it was, and enjoy their friends and family and all who would gather. It's the third day of this wedding. 
It said Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there. Jesus and the disciples were there. Well, of course they were there. Cana is only three miles from Galilee. In fact, it's not quite three miles. They all knew each other. They grew up together. You see, people didn't travel in the ancient world and move away like we do today. You know, you may have family that lives, your children may live on the West Coast or in the Northeast, and you live here, etc. People didn't do that in biblical days. They all lived right in that area. They probably played with each other as children on the playground. Therefore, of course, Jesus and the disciples and Mary were at, at this wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Now in today's world, if you go to a wedding reception and they run out of wine or whatever beverage they're serving, it's not the end of the world. But in the ancient world, it was. Remember, look at it through their eyes, their culture. It was a terrible offense not to have appropriate hospitality. Remember the story that Jesus told. We don't understand that story unless we understand that hospitality was imperative for them in their culture. Remember the story was that this family had bedded down for the night, had gone to, to bed, and they had animals in their house with them. They had everybody bedded down. And the neighbor suddenly has unexpected guests. He doesn't have provision to feed them hospitality. And remember Jesus says that the man came and knocked on the door of his neighbor. And the neighbor said, leave us alone. We've already gone to bed. He continues to knock. He says, leave us alone. Remember that? You can talk to me. You remember the story? And he kept knocking and knocking and knocking until finally Jesus said the man got up. Well, the reason was because the man realized hospitality is imperative. This guy's in a mess, and so I'm going to go help him and give him some provision. This is a serious offense that they had run out of wine. And Jesus said to her, woman. Now, Rhonda, stand up for a minute, would you? <laughs> Rhonda's one of our newest members. If I came up to you and said, woman, you going to like that? Sir. <laughs> in our culture, thank you. In our culture, that's demeaning. That's an insult. That's reducing the person. In their culture, it's endearing to refer to a female woman. Remember on the cross, Jesus looked at his own mother and said, woman, this is your new son. And he said to John, this is your new mother. He was entrusting the care of his own mother to John by saying, woman, an endearing term. Remember, their culture, not ours. Woman, what concern is that to you or to me? My hour has not yet come. And that's important, too, to remember Jesus had not started his ministry. He's there as a guest. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. Now let's think about that for a moment. Six times 20 is 120. That's a lot of wine. Six times 30 is 180. That is a whole lot of wine. That's what they have standing there. And Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water. And they filled them to the brim. Now remember their culture, their eyes. They didn't go over to a spigot and attach a hose and turn it on and put it in the jar and let it fill all the way to the brim. They had to carry that water by hand in a bucket. They didn't have a spigot. They had to go to the town well and pull it up out of the ground and then carry, and that town well, by the way, is between 200 and 300 yards away. They had to carry 
either 120 or 180 gallons of water. You ever carried water? It's heavy. 120, 180 gallons up to those jars. They had to get a ladder, climb up on the ladder, and pour it in. And it says they fill them to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it, and when the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know from where it had come, he called the the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guest had become drunk. But you kept the good wine until now. You know, some people say, well, you know, this was a miracle. And, you know, I want you to notice that when Jesus had them draw some wine out, he didn't, did not say, let me look at it and make sure the water turned into wine. He did not say, let me taste it and make sure I don't have to say some more words over it to make sure it's the appropriate vintage. He just said, draw some out, go take it to the wine steward. Why? It's because Jesus knew who he was. And he still does, friends. Jesus knows what he's doing. We need to remember that. A lot of people say this was the first miracle that took place. This isn't the first miracle. In fact, changing water into wine is a nice thing, but that's not the miracle. The miracle is in verse 5. Verse 5 says, do what he tells you to do, and they did it. It's ridiculous. They could have said to him, look, you're not in charge of this. You're not the groom's family. You're not the groom. You're not the one who's paying for this, and after all, They ask for wine. They're not out of water. And yet you want us to carry 120 to 180 gallons of water from the town well, climb a ladder, put it in there. It's ridiculous. It's absurd. But they did it. Do what he tells you to do, said Mary, and they did it. It's almost as ridiculous as you giving your life to Jesus Christ. It's almost as ridiculous as you giving your marriage to Jesus Christ. It's almost as ridiculous as you giving your finances to Jesus Christ. It's almost as ridiculous as you giving your children and your family to Jesus Christ. It's almost as ridiculous as you giving your career to Jesus Christ. It's almost as ridiculous as you giving everything in your health situation to Jesus Christ. And friends, it's almost as ridiculous as giving the big canoe chapel to Jesus Christ. Trust him. He knows what he's doing. Do you? Do you? Do what he tells you to do. He's in charge, not you and not me. Brenda. Brenda lived in Atlanta, went to Georgia Tech. Graduated, was offered a fine job. She did well in her job. She was offered a position, a promotion to go to Denver. She moved to Denver. She didn't know anybody. There in Denver, she, after a while, was invited some of the office personnel to go on a rock climbing. She'd never climbed rocks before. She didn't really want to go, but she thought this would be a way to meet some people, to get to know people and so forth. So she's out there with the ropes and so forth, climbing up the rocks. She's thinking, why in the world did I let them talk me into this? This is ridiculous. She's climbing, and as she's trying to go a little further, she hits one of her ropes. It goes across her face. It knocks both of her contact lens out. Brenda is practically blind without her contact lens. And she said, oh, Lord, please help me. I don't know what to do. And down below, in just a few seconds, a person says, did anybody up there lose a contact lens? She thought, Lord, that's a quick answer to prayer. (laughs) And she said, well, yeah, I did. He said, well, just wait and I'll bring it to you. He comes up beside her. She said, how did you ever find my contact lens? 
He said, well, it was strange. I had my hands in those rocks and I looked forward and it was an ant. And the ant had a contact lens on its back. <laughs> and that ant was struggling, walking with that contact lens. That's why I called out. I would never seen it had been for the ant. I called out. You said yes. I took it away from the ant, brought it up here to you. That night, Brenda calls her father who lived in Atlanta, told him what had happened. Her father is a cartoonist. And her father drew a picture and sent it to her of an ant with this contact lens on top walking along and the bubble that shows what the ant is thinking coming down pointing to the ant's head says, Lord, I don't know why you want me to carry this thing. I don't know what it is. I tried to eat it, but it doesn't taste good. I don't know what, you, what your purpose is. But if you want me to carry it, I will. That's it. That's it. Lord, I don't know what you have in mind, but if you want me to carry it, I'll do it. Do what he tells you to do. I was a senior pastor at Sam Jones Memorial Church for 12 years. After six months of being there, cable TV was new and we were on television six days a week, 11 o'clock live. And at the end of those 12 years, I was then going to go to Decatur First Methodist as a senior pastor and their pastor was coming to, Deca to Sam Jones Memorial. I got a phone call from a couple, told me their names. And they said, Dr. Green? I said, well, please call me Tommy. He said, no, no, you're our pastor. We want to call you Dr. Green. And I thought, I don't know these people. And while they were talking, I got out the directory of church members. I looked, and their name wasn't on there. And then they gave a word of explanation without me even asking. They said, we belong to such and such church, another church in the community. And they said, but our health has been bad. And so you become our pastor through television. We've been watching you for 12 years. They said, we even bought the hymnal of your church because it's different from ours so we could sing the song along with the congregation. And we noticed you always preach from the New Revised Standard Version. And they said, we bought one of those. We could read scripture along with you and you become our parents. And we want to thank you for what you've done for us during your 12 years. And we know God will use you at Decatur First Methodist, et cetera, et cetera. Then they said, can we tell you what we do every Sunday? I said, well, please do. They said, we sit on the sofa, we have our hymnal, we have our Bible, and then just before the TV comes on with the worship service, we hold hands and we say the same prayer. And the prayer is this. Dear Lord, please bless Sam Jones Church and bless Dr. Green and bless us for we are all reporting for duty. In Jesus' name, amen. Did you hear that? We are reporting for duty. That's it. That's it. We don't write the agenda. We are to surrender and report for duty. We're in sales. He's management. We get that confused. We are reporting for duty. Do what he tells you to do. Even though it may sound absolutely ridiculous, even though it makes no sense to you, it doesn't matter whether it makes sense to you. It made no sense to the ant to carry the contact lens. Be a part of the puzzle, a part of God's will. It's a privilege to be used. It's a privilege to be part of the plan and all of us are a part of his plan. If you really believe he did it together in your mother's womb and has a perfect plan for you, do it. Report for duty. Do what he tells you to do. You know, I told you that I went to Decatur and this gentleman came to Sam Jones Bill was about 20 years older than me. Dr. Bill Edwards, wonderful preacher, wonderful gentleman. His brother was a bishop. He had been a district superintendent and 
Bill was coming. He wrote an article introducing me to the people of Decatur and telling them goodbye. And I thought he did a splendid, brilliant job of that. And he used two Greek words. He used the word kairos and chronos. I'm sure you know this, but chronos means regular time. 60 minutes in an hour, seven days in a week. And he said his chronos time at Decatur First was over and that mine was about to begin. And he thanked the people for his time there and asked them to pray for me as I came. He then said and invited them to look through Kairos eyes. In Kairos eyes, God's timing, God's way, God's will. And I invite you to do that in your personal life. Don't just look at it in regular time. Look at it through God's eyes. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you where you fit in the puzzle and do it. And just do it. You know, friends, this chapel is in the midst of searching for a new senior pastor. Some of the people on the search committee are here today. But for all of us, for all of us, look at that search through Kairos eyes. God's timing, not ours. God's will, not ours. God's person, not ours. And with everything in our lives, not my way, but his way. Not your will, but his will. Do what he tells you to do. I don't know, said the aunt, why you want me to carry this thing. But if you want me to, I will. I am reporting for duty. They said to me, is that your words? Lord, I'm reporting for duty. It's yours. The big canoe chapel, it's yours. The marriage, it's yours. The finances are yours. The children are yours. My future, my career, it's yours. Do what he tells you to do. The blind man. The blind man went out every evening when it got dark He'd light a lamp, and he'd go out and have his walk. A person came up to him and said, Mr. Blind Man, I say this with great respect, and I certainly hope I don't offend you, but sir, you're blind. Why do you carry a lantern? You, the lantern's no use to you. Why do you carry it? And the blind man said, oh, you haven't offended me at all. I carry the lantern for two reasons. One is, I don't want to be a stumbling block to anybody. I want people to be able to see me and so that they don't trip or I'm not in their way or an obstacle. Secondly, even though this light is no use to me, hopefully I can light the path for somebody else so they can see. You can only do that when you trust the Lord Jesus and do what he tells you to do. It's not about you. It's not about me, it's about him. Do what he tells you to do. We're not an obstacle and we're shedding light for someone else. I close with this. The grandfather, the grandfather gave to his granddaughter, Sarah. Sarah was six years old. A paper cup, about like that, had dirt in it. He told Sarah, he said, I want you to put this in your window cell in your bedroom and every morning and every evening, I want you to pour just a little water in it. She said, okay, I'll do that. He said, just trust me, just do it. Well, she did it. After 10 days, nothing happened. She thought, I wonder why he told me to do it, but he told me just to trust him and to do it. 10 more days, she did it, nothing. The 28th day, she was about to quit. But she thought, well, that's my grandfather. And he asked me, and on the 29th day, when she went in there that morning and started to pour the water in, wow, there it was. The little plant had stuck its head out of the soil, and she was so excited it had grown and was sprouting. And she went and called her grandfather. She said, granddaddy, granddaddy, guess what, guess what? He said, what? 
She said, all it needed was a little water and this plant has come out. And he said, no, no, Sarah, that's not true. She said, oh, yes, Granny, it, it stuck its head out. He said, Sarah, that plant didn't need the water. What it needed was your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. Big Canoe Chapel needs our faithfulness. Do what he tells you to do. And when you do that, he will fill our cups to overflowing. If you look toward me, please, with your eyes open to receive the benediction. Gracious and almighty God, do fill our cup, please. And help us to be faithful, to trust you, and to just report for duty. Because we want to be fully your obedient children. In Jesus' name, amen.